Log Hansen is a two-word angle fracture classification system that is based on two biomechanical positions. The first word describes the position of the foot during the time of injury. The foot can either be pronated or supinated. Pronation is a combination of eversion, abduction, and dorsiflexion, whereas supination is a combination of inversion, adduction, and plantarflexion. In the pronated position, the medial ligaments or the deltoid ligaments of the ankle are fully stretched and therefore more susceptible to injury. In supination, the lateral ankle ligaments are fully stretched and therefore more susceptible to injury. The second word describes the movement of the talus within the ankle mortis relative to the tibia. And it is a movement of the talus that is actually causing all the injury. Keep in mind the talus itself is not being injured, Rather, its movement is what's damaging the surrounding architecture. And for the four major classifications that we're going to talk about, all you need to know is that the talus is either going to invert, evert, or laterally rotate. There are four major classification systems in Log Hansen. Two of them describe the foot's position as pronated during the time of injury, and two of them as supinated. We'll begin our discussion with the pronation injuries, starting with PER. PER, or pronation external rotations, describes an injury in which the foot is in a fixed pronated position and some force causes the talus to rotate laterally. There are four stages in PER. Starting medially, we work our way in a clockwise fashion until we end up at the posterior aspect of the ankle joint. In PER1, there are three possibilities. One possibility is an avulsion fracture of the medial malleolus, in which case on x-ray, you'll see a transverse fracture, and that is due to pull of the deltoid ligaments. Another possibility is a tear of the deltoid ligaments. Now, you don't actually see a tear on x-ray, but what you would see is an increase in the medial gutter space, and this can be appreciated on an AP or an ankle mortis view. A third possibility is a combination of both meaning on x-ray you would see a transverse fracture and an increase in the medial gutter space. In PER2, there are three possibilities, and they all have to do with an injury or pull of the anterior, inferior, tibial fibular ligament. One possibility is simply a tear of the ligament. The second possibility is an avulsion fracture of the anterior tubercle of the tibia also known as a talot chaput fracture. Sometimes in these types of injuries, what you might see is a decrease in the overlap between the tibia and the fibula. And the reason for that is that the syndesmosis might be injured. The third possibility is an avulsion fracture of the fibula, and that eponym is known as a Wagstaff fracture. In PER3, we see a spiral oblique fracture of the fibula above the level of the ankle joint, making this a Dennis Weber C. These fractures are often very proximal and can even be as high as the fibular neck, and the eponym for that fracture would be a Mason U. By the way, what would you worry about for a fracture that is so high in the fibula? There's a possibility that the common peroneal nerve may be damaged. In PER4, there are three possibilities and all of them have to do with injury or pull of the posterior, inferior, tibial fibular ligament. One possibility is a tear of the ligament. Another possibility is an avulsion fracture of the posterior tubercle of the tibia, and the eponym for that is a Volkmann's fracture. And a third possibility is a combination of an avulsion fracture and a tear of the ligament. As you can see, we've completed a complete circle around the ankle joint. We begin medially, and then we went anterior, then we went lateral, and finally we came back posterior, making this a true ankle diastasis. Before we move on to the next classification system, one thing to keep in mind is that all of these are additive, meaning if you had a PR3, you must have had a PER1 and 2. The next one we're going to talk about is PAB, or pronation abduction. And this has three stages. And in here, the mechanism of injury is that the talus everts. A PAB1 looks exactly like a PER1. 
So, you can either see a transverse avulsion fracture of the medial malleolus or a tear of the deltoid ligaments, which will cause an increase in the medial gutter space or a combination of both. In a PAB2, the talus will evert and is driven dorsally and laterally into the syndesmosis. This will simultaneously injure the anterior and posterior inferior tibiofibular ligaments. In some cases, you might see an avulsion fracture off the posterior tubercle of the tibia, also known as a Volkmann's fracture. Finally, in PAB3, as the talus continues to evert, the lateral malleolus will bend dorsally. This will cause a comminuted compressive fracture at the level of the ankle joint, making this a Dennis Weber B. Some clinicians will call this a butterfly fracture. Next, we're going to move on to the supinatory injuries. We'll begin our discussion with SER, which is supination external rotation. This is by far the most common mechanism of injury of ankle fractures. The foot begins in a fixed supinated position, and some force causes the talus to rotate laterally, just like we saw in PER. In stage 1, there is injury to the anterior, inferior, tibiofibular ligament and we can see the same potential injuries that we saw in a PER2. Next, we'll talk about SER2. It is the most common of the SER injuries and is often tested on boards part 2. It is a spiral oblique fracture of the fibula that begins at the level of the ankle joint, making it a Dennis Weber B. The fracture line courses from anterior inferior to posterior superior. In SER3, there is an injury or pull of the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. So it has the same potential injuries that we saw in PER4. In SER4, there is a pull or injury of the deltoid ligaments. So once again, like we saw in PER1 and PAB1, you can see an avulsion fracture of the medial malleolus or a tear of the deltoid ligaments, which would increase the medial gutter space. So really the only difference between SER and PER is the level of the fibular fracture. In PER, it was a high fibular fracture, making it a Dennis rubber C, whereas in SER, it's a Dennis rubber B at the level of the ankle joint. Finally, we're going to end our discussion with SAD, which is supination adduction. The mechanism of injury is inversion of the talus. There are only two stages. In stage 1, we see a transverse fibular fracture slightly below the level of the ankle joint, making this a Dennis Weber A. Finally, in SAD2, as the talus continues to invert, it moves up dorsally and medially, causing an intraarticular vertical fracture of the medial malleolus. And that completes the four main classifications of Log Hansen. Now, just a little mnemonic that I use to remember SAD is that if you guys recall from PER, we see a high fibular fracture, a Dennis Weber C. In PAB and SER, we see a fracture at the level of the ankle joint, making it a Dennis Weber B. But in SAD, it's below the level of the ankle joint. So I like to think of it as someone who's frowning because he's sad. It's a silly mnemonic, but it helps me remember it. Now, you really do need to know these classification systems because it's going to be asked of you during your rotations and during interviews. And you also need to keep in mind that not every single ankle fracture necessarily has to fall into one of these four categories. Sometimes you might be asked a trick question, and this happened to one of my classmates actually during our final exam in our radiology capstone. She was given an x-ray, and it was an AP, lateral, and ankle mortis. And what happened was, the person had a transverse fracture at the level of the distal metaphyseal diaphyseal junction of the tibia. And it was like a Dennis Weber C transverse fracture here in the fibula. I'm not sure what caused that, and she called it a PER3. And at the end, the professor said, actually, there is no classification for it. But she said PER3 because she saw the high fibular fracture. But it can't be because there was nothing wrong with the medial malleolus. There was no increased medial gutter space. There was nothing wrong with the syndesmosis. And yet she said that. 
and he said actually all you had to say was Dennis over C and a transverse fracture at the distal metaphyseal diaphyseal junction. So don't get thrown off and think that anytime you see an ankle view you have to classify log Hansen. Sometimes you just have to describe what you see in simple terms and that's usually good enough.